people are kind of other sectors have changed, such as you look how retail's changed, banking's changed, how we access media with Netflix, all those kind of things, that people's expectations have changed. And this is an opportunity to put put trans you know, people at the heart of the transport system and to deliver things in a different way which is more customer friendly as well as delivering sort of societal value in terms of you know, environmental benefits and managing the transport networks more efficiently, optimization and also in terms of safety aspects as well as division, delivering operational efficiencies. So it's a massive opportunity um, given all these things coming together for a massive step change in, in, in transport um, for a variety of reasons. And data is kind of, is the foundation of innovation, which is kind of what as a department and what as a government we're looking to do to generate those efficiencies and those new products and services. We were kind of familiar with the, the usual suspects such as City Mapper, Uber, and all those kind of stuff. There's so much more that could, could be done and it kind of feels that we're at the cusp of something in, in, in transport, but we're perhaps at a low level of maturity compared to other sectors in terms of exploiting those technologies, which gives us a massive opportunity and to be able to join up our transport system that is, is very kind of modal and actually to make that a more connected, integrated system and develop things that as we commonly now call mobility as a service, which is a term which is kind of, again, which is kind of almost used on a daily basis back at the ranch. And we won't talk about these things even uh, 18 months ago. Um, data also gives us an opportunity to develop new policy insights and also to nudge people's behaviours. So we understand more about how people are travelling, why they're travelling, is actually we can then nudge people towards more active travel choices and that kind of stuff, so through incentives. So again, it just gives us loads of different opportunities to deliver transport in different ways. Also gives us the opportunity to improve the planning management and the optimization of transport networks. If we have that more data, if we have more live data, increased connectivity, we can monitor what's going on in our networks and respond to things like disruption in a, a more rapid way. We can, um, with predictive analytics, you can kind of work out where the congestion might be based on weather patterns. You can plan in advance and make things hopefully a lot smoother. Um, and data and connectivity, etc., opens up all those kind of new things which we want to exploit. We should also forget that actually transport is a system, but it's also within other systems, it's a systems of systems approach, and that transport links to things like our energy management systems, our smarter, smarter places, smarter infrastructure, and actually there's an opportunity there to do exciting new things and new innovations of how transport can interact with those, connect with those services to provide things that we can't even, you know, can't even receive yet to make sure that we can deliver things that are greener um, and better for the public. A lot about the opportunities, um, because they are, I believe, they're massive, but there are some practical challenges, which I'm sure you're um, kind of filling in the room. Um, the usual thing that, you know, data needs to be shared in a way that is protected and ensures privacy. None of this is going to work if people lose trust in how their data is going to be used. And we've had a snapshot of that through things like Cambridge Analytica, etc., the Facebook stuff. Um, and also, it's the right thing to do. People expect their data to be protected and used um, carefully. And there's also there's a security aspect of maintaining our national infrastructure and stuff like that. So we have to make sure that it's not open to um, people who want to do malicious things with it. I think it's also safe to say um, that there's a cultural reluctance to share data in the transport sector. Um, that perhaps for obvious reasons, because of the commercial sensitivities. Um, <coughs> but because of that, a lot of data isn't being shared and we're not getting that value from combining those various data sets and getting that innovation. And it's probably holding back the whole of the transport um, industry and there's an opportunity to grow the cake as a, as a, as a whole. Um, there's also skills gaps. Uh, I think that's safe to say that's the whole, an issue for the whole of the UK economy in terms of data and digital skills. 
but I think it's particularly acute in transport. Um, how do you attract people with those skill sets to work in transport when they could work in Google? Um, you know, I think I'd rather work in transport myself, but that's, that's, just, that's just a personal thing. Um, and you know, it's, it's difficult to retain, uh, to recruit and retain staff, and we're looking at ways at how we can um, help local authorities and the transport industry with that. Another problem with, um, another challenge is, that I, could talk, I could stand up here for, you know, I won't, I promise you, for an hour or two talking lyrically about how all the opportunities that transport, uh, transport data can deliver and all the exciting things we can do. But I have no evidence for that. I can't go here, bits of paper, here's a report saying if you do X, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, this is going to happen and the, the benefits are going to be, be this, the benefit cost ratio is going to be five to one. That does not exist. Um, that doesn't exist for you guys in local authorities. It doesn't exist for the transport operators. And it's not just a UK thing. That's kind of a that's, that's a kind of a global phenomenon. We've done our research. We did uh, liter external um, literary reviews, all the stuff you expect stuff you expect us to do. And a lot, there's been a lot of activity, but people haven't been documenting it. They haven't been. Um, logging the lessons learned, they've not been disseminating and documenting those lessons. So those kind of, those kind of things have been lost. Um, and so we don't have that rich evidence base to make decisions. So intuitively we can feel that there's opportunities here, but we, can't, we haven't got that kind of the numbers, the evidence to back that up yet. Which is a barrier when you have to go to your um, local politicians and for when the private sector has to go to their board saying, I want to do this, I want to invest this kind of money. Yeah, where's your proof, where's your evidence? So that, that's, that's, that. I think that's a problem. Um, linked to that is actually, again, putting all those kind of benefits into a transport cent uh, situation doesn't really exist either. So in terms of actually what, how can you, <coughs> in terms of transport specific use cases. So. If you wanted to do a bit of a service or you wanted to improve access to a rail station and stuff like that, there's no kind of documentation of how you would do that. Um, and again, that, 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 that's, that's, that, that's a challenge. I also think there's actually, um, in reality of all this, there's actually very little incentive for people to share their data, actually, in the, uh, the truth of it. The, it's not a costless activity. We can talk about, well, we make your data open and stuff like that. We understand that's not costless. You've got to do something that, uh, that, and it has a, a resource cost, it has a financial cost. Um, there's some risks, perhaps mostly uh, perceived risks, of releasing that data. What are other people going to do with it? Am I going to breach data security regulations, GDPR? all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of, mm, what's in it for me? This is all very, very difficult. And again, that, that, that leads us to um, missing out on opportunities. Another challenge which I think um, <laughs> I acutely feel is actually how do you coordinate all this? We, we have, have got a very rich, complex and fast evolving data landscape. There's this, com this presentation is very different than it would have been six months ago or a year ago and it's moving very very quickly that presents us with a challenge and I suspect with people in this room of how to keep up to date with that to make sure that we are current and the fact that we're not reinventing the wheel spending taxpayers money on something that's already been done in another local authority that's been done down the road in a different part of the um, the country or elsewhere so how do we kind of coordinate that without stifling innovation and um, letting a thousand flowers bloom, as it were. Also, we, you're essentially moving to the exciting world of things like predictive analytics, where actually you have the data, the historical data, combined with other data such as weather to predict what's going to forecast, predict what's going to happen to help you do your transport planning. However, that flip side of that is that actually you, that allows people to have control. And if you're uh, a company, I'm not mentioning any names, but if you've got, you're basically mining loads and loads and loads of data, 
that gives you potentially a lot of control and market dominance. And that's something that is of concern to our ministers about how people's data is being used, how it's going to be used, and to make sure that's going to be for the public good. And we've commissioned some research about how the, the risks of that and how we might mitigate those risks, particularly from things like mobility platforms, where they're going to have huge amounts of data about the transport network. And then as they grow, they're going to have even more data about people's movements, which can then give them reinforce that first mover advantage. That's something that we need to be very watchful of. So what are we doing about it? Um, we, in terms of the data we hold as a department, we publish what we can on datagov.uk. Not the perfect um, mechanism for doing so, but there's lots of good data out there um, and we're looking at how we can actually improve that offer. We also, because we as a central department do not hold loads and loads of data, live data, that's that kind of data that, we'd, that innovators, data developers actually want to do the exciting things with. We just don't actually hold a lot of that data. We tend to have a lot of data to run our transport models, but also statistics, um, which obviously help in terms of you know, research, openness and transparency, but not in terms of the app development and new innovation. So a lot of what we do is trying to get others, third parties, to share their data. So for example, uh, we have a joint rail data action plan and the rail sector deal. So we've been working very closely with the rail industry for the last couple of years to get them to uh, share their data. Um, and now the core data sets are now are made open. They, they might not be perfect, but they're out there and we're working with the industry through the action plan to improve the quality and accessibility of that data and, there is, and that has been leading to some innovation and there's some more feeds about rolling stock that are coming live soon and it's, 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 there's a constant stream of new data coming out on the rail industry which is great. There's something my colleagues have been working on called Street Manager which is uh, road works and street works um, and that could transform, will transform the way um, road works and street works manage this country, allow us to hold utility companies better to account, to provide greater information to the travelling public about road closures and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that will be ready in some summer, this summer. There's the Bus Open Data Programme, which is comes on the back of the Bus Service Act 2017, which was a realisation for us in the department that um, we needed to regulate to get the bus industry to share their data. Um, when they were privatised, there was no requirement to do so. They had no requirement to share their fares data, uh, for example, their timetables. And that is now going to be a requirement. And we're working with the industry and other stakeholders on actually making that work and to um, how to make that data open. And also, particularly relevant to people in this room, is the Local Data Action Plan, which Graham and his team and his colleagues will be talking about in more detail in later sessions. This comes from, a, um, from our ministers that actually <coughs> had feedback that local data was a barrier to, it, to, to innovation. And I think that it's a lot more complicated than that. So we did a discovery, which Northern Highland did for us, which is really, really comprehensive, which Graham will talk about in more detail. And it came out of a number of actions, recommendations, which we're now taking forward. Um, and which Graham will talk about. And other stuff that we're doing, we've got various connected vehicle trials within the department, within the Centre for um, Connected Autonomous Vehicles. We have the Local Authority Mobility Platform, which we're talking about later. Even though we call it a platform, it's not a platform. But anyway, we'll be talking about that later. We've also um, been working on the feasibility of a national metadata catalogue. So one of the things that's um, come up through our research and engagement is the fact that people don't actually, and there's a lot more data out there than people realise, but people can't find it. So how can you better signpost it? So it's not going to be the fact that we're going to create a massive data warehouse or a data lake, as they're now called, within the department. Um, but we're looking at how can we signpost where that data is held. 
um, so people can then find and uh, you know cause they can post at what data they've got and um, hopefully get access to other people's data and do exciting things with it. We're also working with our friends in CCAV on a vehicle data scoping study. Uh, you, you probably, as you, you know, that cars are collecting so, so much data and that has so many potential uses for um, the benefit of society as well as commercial values. And how can we harness that for the public good? How can we use that data to improve road safety at the same time to make sure that that data is being used properly by those that are collecting it? Um, and I've already mentioned the competition impacts work as well. There's more. Right, so I've already mentioned the Future of Mobility Grand Challenge. That is going to the, the strategy of that is going to be published shortly. Um, and as part of that, there's going to be a regulatory review. We are, we, as I mentioned earlier, that we're, we're potentially at a cusp of something. And there's an opportunity for government now to step in, potentially to stop things or to enable things. And that window of opportunity is not going to be around there forever. And so it's an opportunity for us and people in this room to like take a, a deep breath and thinking, do we like this or not? Or what bits do we like? What bits don't we like? And what should we do about it? Um, and there's going to be a number of themes from the regulatory review. One of those could well be data. Um, to make sure the fact that, you know, to get that opportunity, but also to make sure the fact that there's safeguards in, in place and the fact that we don't get unintended consequences, that the actual transport system actually improves, is better for the customer rather than having a road network that is chock-a-block with autonomous vehicles and no one moving. Or the fact that we're all tripping over micro scooters. And, you know, so there's some... Decisions as policy making as uh, policy makers and for ministers to make about actually what do we want this to look like? Um, because if we don't, it's going to be done to us. Um, um, so that that's that's a big, uh, a very big piece of work. There's also the Tan Transport Technology Forum, which Graham's involved with. We've got the Transport Data Initiative, obviously. Uh, we've just set up a new central data team um, in the department, which is a new thing for us. Uh, my colleague Giuseppe is going to be on the panel later, heads that up. Um, and we're working very closely on that. We're looking at how we improve the use of data and manage data within our department, but also how we can help others manage their data. And we're going to be developing a data strat strategy for transport over the coming year. And emphasis on possible, we're thinking about having an external panel of stakeholders to advise us on that. So it'd be a mix of academics, local authorities, uh, business, SMEs, etc., to be his critical friend to help us in and putting that strategy together. But um, just an idea and no commitment. Um, and this is all underpinned by an ethical security and privacy considerations. We're also thinking about actually that all because something's legal doesn't mean it's ethical. And we're also looking at how we can take data ethics into account in our decision making and whether we need to issue guidance. Do we need a panel to help us with all that kind of stuff? So it's early, early days on that, but these are the kind of things we're, we're thinking about. So that's, all, all, that's just all the stuff that we're doing within the department, and that's not an exhaustive list. Um, there's also wider stuff that's going on across um, government. There is going to be uh, a national data strategy, which is going to be led from the DCMS, uh, Ministry of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. Um, that was progressing quite nicely. And then something beginning with B, ending with T, um, it's kind of got in the way um, and it's on hold. Um, we're working, we've been working very closely with on that and trans they are very interested in transport in this and we've been working very closely with those, so watch this space. There's also a AI Council on 
data, loads of thinking around in government about how we can increase productivity and stuff through um, artificial intelligence, machine learning. There's also a Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. There's a Geospace uh, Commission which brings in various um, bodies together, such as the Ordnance Survey, Land Registry, under one umbrella to how make sure how we can make better use of geospatial data. Um, they've got some money, um, so keep an eye on out for that, which may or may not be open to local authorities. We'll keep you informed of that through the newsletter. Um, the DCMS and the Open Data Institute are doing data trust pilots. And also we're interested in those from a transport perspective because that could be a potentially way of um, breaking some of the deadlock about sharing data. So it's kind of like, you know, familiar with how trusts work. I have the idea that, that we do something like that within data. So it's, it's kind of um, administered, managed by independent trustees. So we're, we're looking at that. Our colleagues in the uh, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government um, also have things like digital declaration. We're working increasingly closely um, with our colleagues there. They sit on our data board and we sit on theirs now. And there's loads of opportunities for joint working. There's also the Bay Smart Data Review where they're looking at how data could be used in regulated, regulated markets to improve the um, customer offer. If you look at what's been happening in open banking, that's there's a lot of innovation coming out of that quite quickly and they're interested about what could be done in say the rail sector for example there um, and data trust is mentioned twice there's also stuff being done outside um, government um, there's a digital institute out of Newcastle University which is doing lots of um, good work about helping businesses etc make better use of their data and train them up I kind of think there's opportunities for them to help local authorities more and it's on my long to-do list to go and speak to Professor Paul Watson who's director there who is a good friend of the department and our science advisory council um, to talk about how he can actually help local authorities more in this space so we'll report back on that. There's the Alan Turing Institute, there's the Open Data Institute, there's Innovate UK, we've got Carla Jakeman here who's going to be on our panel later and uh, all the various catapults uh, there's Ordnance Survey and Geoplace, and we've got Baz here as well from there. We have something called the Transport Research and Innovation Board, which has all the kind of the research funders um, in transport all get together and talk about actually how we can be more coordinated and how we spend all our money on research, which is, which is a great idea. One of the strategic objectives of their is priorities is data. And Paul Campion, the current CEO of Transport Systems Catapult, is the champion for that and we're working very closely on how we make that work and we're looking at actually what are things we could do on the ground such as pilots etc to actually test and work out some ideas. Um, lots of stuff that's going on in our cities, um, loads of data platforms being created, there's some work that ADEPT have commissioned WSP to do which I'm tuning into trying to map all that because how can they all kind of work together? And what we don't want to create in an unintended way is loads of geographical silos, that you have loads of data platforms that can't talk to each other. So there's part of the work we're doing is we've commissioned the British Standards Institute to do a scoping study on data standards and data interoperability. Um, that's going at quite a pace and we should get a draft by April, end of financial year, um, to advise us on a roadmap for taking that forward. Massive opportunity to try to get some consistency in how we do data which would help sharing and also I think an opportunity for the UK to steal a march on other people and get our house in order and to grow our markets and, and, and um, develop an opportunity um, for business and to um, consultancies etc. So that's all for me. I, that comes across as a bit of a shopping list um, and a bit of a menu, but that's kind of deliberate because I wanted to demonstrate to people that there is a lot of stuff that's going on and give you kind of a, a flavour of that kind of stuff <coughs> to give you the opportunity to dip into some of that stuff that's particularly relevant um, and also to get your feedback is, you know, have we missed anything? Is there stuff that you're aware of? that um, 
that's not listed there that we need to be aware of. Are there any other challenges that I, we haven't listed? Any other opportunities we've missed? Um, any suggestions from you guys on you know how we can help you realise those opportunities? Anything that's going on uh, amongst yourselves that we we're not aware of yet? And and how can we communicate more with you going forward? And that's it from me. So we could take some. We've got a Q&A session, but a uh, panel session, but I, I think it's a good opportunity to ask, you know, and to ask any questions now before we move over to, uh, to Graham. There's a roving mic as well. Thomas is going to be walking around with a mic. So if you could say who you are and where you're from, that would be really helpful. Well, good morning, Mark. It's Pete Jenkins from Sheffield City Council. Uh, I'm traffic manager at Sheffield, and one of the things that we're involved with now is getting new hiring funding for new hiring schemes. I'm just wondering whether the part of the FT looks at our business case for new hiring schemes funding, the WebTag process. Mm. I was just wondering whether WebTag was actually on your radar as something that you need that's what I'm looking at. The, the sources of data that are expected to build your business case in most traffic models and anything else that's required to gain that funding are quite expensive, they take quite a lot of time and they're due for a change. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're in the same directorate um, as the uh, web tag team. It's the same. Um, we work closely with them. They are constantly looking at how to um, improve the way they they do things. There's got to be there has got to be a, met, a robust methodology to do these things, given the amounts of money that are are, are involved. I think we are certainly aware that they, you know as times of changing as new technologies come along that actually could we do things in a more rapid agile cost effective way and those discussions uh, are underway um, but they're going to, because of the you're talking about billions of pounds worth of taxpayers money there has to be a proper process for doing that That's a very sensible point, Paul, because I think we're coming from very much like the open data agenda from a few years ago, which was understandably quite evangelical about opening up, up, up data. I think that that's, it's become more nuanced over time and evolving to a kind of understanding of actually, especially with the increased um, awareness of sort of privacy issues and stuff like that is actually what do we need this data for what is the problem we're trying to solve and then going to get that data so you're just not having uh, people's data just for the sake of it and I think that um, from personal experience we, we went through something similar in the department where it actually was like why aren't we releasing all our data you know what you know and actually we didn't have as much data as people thought we had um, and that's the Department for Transport. So I imagine that's the same around this room. So there's a, a bit about a, a getting some realism about actually what data is actually held and doing some mapping um, of where the, those key data sets are held. My, my sort of take on this is a lot of the sort of the really big live data sets, the really kind of meaty data sets that are kind of for innovation are often held by third parties. 
and that's quite a challenge for us and that's something we'll be looking at as part of the regulatory review about how we can incentivise those companies regulate, not regulate, other methods available to um, get them to share their data. Um, so this is all the stuff we're thinking about, but I, I think you're right, Paul, there's often, sometimes there's not as much data there as people think there is, which presents some challenges, and in terms of expectation management. So thank you for that. Nick. Oh no. <laughs> I speak as the man who took NAPTAN, the National Access uh, Nodes uh, uh, XML uh, project, in the house into the department. I sort of regret doing it. It was a piece of emergency surgery at the time. This is this is the Access Node uh, file that underpins all the stuff that we have across the entire country. Um, I know that the department is doing a lot on buses data at the moment. I wonder whether you had any plans to look at how that um, could be done in future, because it's incredibly inefficient, particularly for nat uh, national aggregators, to ingest a huge XML file. I mean, it really is huge. And it's updated <coughs> quite regularly. Uh, and, and whether or not you had plans to come revisit how you do it, where it's hosted, in order to make the whole thing easier and more dynamic. Very sensible question. I'm going to hand it over to Giuseppe to answer. say there is an emergent need for that to happen and my team has been asked to look into how we take forward and after uh, the future. And there are several needs uh, and for example what happens if uh, local authorities boundaries, authority boundaries are redesigned, you know, things happen with NAFTA and at the moment there's no real capability within the FD to, to do that and we're trying to make it. So yeah, it's definitely not right Hi, it's uh, Llewellyn from Oxygen. Um, I suppose my thought, question is that um, from our perspective, we've done lots of data projects. Um, and um, if I look at the money that comes out of government, um, it's mostly capital. So we've been very successful in getting hold of innovative data, I think, but that's us aligning with a commercial art body or organisation. Um, for me, I think this is like a tip of the iceberg. The re reality is, government is fundamentally changing from a capital-driven investment system to a service system, which is why everything has service attached to it, which is mm. revenue-driven. So until we have the fundamental changes of how we fund new things, like so everything new at the moment, we, we, at the moment we, we, we're on, we've got a good chance that we might get half a billion pounds of funding as capital. So it, it, we're still struggling to turn half a billion pound of investment into the things that will probably make a real difference because it's going to get spent on tarmac and it will be predict and provide and we all know what happens. Um, uh, so that's the problem for me. And, and, and it's, not, it's not an attack on DFT, it's the way the government works and it's hard to change that and it's treasury and, um, and the way the government has to balance its books nationally even though I understand that. But, that's the fundamental change. And if we can't change that model, in the same way giant companies are trying to change as well, the car industry is perfect when they run on a capital-based industry, they're trying to move to a revenue-based industry. You know, these are the fundamental change. We're part of that change. Um, if you won't have a sustainable model that allows to support um, a lot of what we've talked about. Um, so an easy, easy, an easy question for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really civil service about this and not take that as a question but take it as a sort of a, a, a comment I think um, if, I, if I may because we've touched on this before and I actually think that this is something the capital revenue thing has been something that has been going on around ever since I've been in working for the Department for Transport so when I've been involved with these events <coughs> 10 or so years ago um, these were the kind of comments that we're, we're still getting and actually it's a perfectly valid comment the fact that we, we put out loads of capital money, and we do, we put out lots and lots of capital money. DFT, I think, is the bigger, biggest capital investor, got the biggest capital investment of all government departments, even more so than the Ministry of Defence. 
I mean, there's HS2 in there as well, which distorts the figures quite a bit. But um, we are big capital spenders. However, that massive opportunities, but some challenges there. And the world is changing. And and I kind of wondering to what extent the fact that actually you know, we are we're going to have to move to a service type model for transport, and that actually some of these challenges that we are talking about here, that actually perhaps that they're brought in, and that actually these are services that are provided by other people that we then buy in, but have to be an intelligent customer um, of. But government moves very slowly, like a big oil tanker, and. I suspect we might get there eventually, um, but it ain't going to be any time soon. But we just got to think about to have these conversations, keep putting out there, because it is a very valid point. It is valid. Can't deny that. Yeah, Walter. Yeah, Walter Tuttleby. I think this is a really important point. It comes up almost at every TDI, I think. Um, but it, there, there seem to be two, two sustainable questions that keep coming up. One is the luck of the business model, um, and one is this issue of the, the move from capital to, to revenue and, and the, the change of that operating model. Yeah. Both of those, I think, come down, or underlying both of those, is the need for some real economic work done that could be used in discussions with Treasury. Because as you know, as was said, it, it's that change of model that is happening. And that is quite a broader thing than, than just practice, as, as we all, I think, eloquently express. Um, but for example, you know, the kind of economic work that could be done just in looking at um, the way that today, um, you know, when local authorities install parking systems, they all spend money evaluating lots of systems. They then procure at low volume. You know, it's actually quite simple economics to show that if you if you adopted standards, you know, you, you could you could you could actually make some significant cost savings. Um, and I mean, I'm thinking back to some of the work that was done four years or more ago now. You know, the transport data revolution stuff that the, the, the transport capital did. You know, I mean. You know, I'm wondering whether there's, there's there's any sort of you know economic resources either there or in other organisations that could be brought to bear to <coughs> to build the evidence base that's needed for those kinds of discussions with Treasury. Again, a very valid point. Um, I think we've got an opportunity in terms of the future ability regulatory review to look at different incentive mechanisms and business models. Because when I've been out, we've been out talking to innovators, the SME sector, they're increasingly talking about trying to do a deal in terms of sharing um, <coughs> revenues. So rather than sort of you give them millions of pounds up front, is that the, for example, they will get a share of the parking revenue. So there's, there's, a, there's a sort of value sharing deal there. And I can see there's mutual benefit on both sides and these are the kind of things that I think we need to start thinking about and doing some intellectual thinking around some economic analysis about kind of what are these kind of alternatives and different business models rather than the usual way we always do things to kind of break some of this this deadlock have you thought about who might do that work and, and uh, that we careful what I say D DFT is a wash with economists um, and I used to be one before the I... 21st century ones or 20th century ones? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no comment to that. Um, and, you know, I used to be one before I went to the dark side of the force, the light side of the force, whichever way you look at it. And um, we are a very analytical department, but I think some of this stuff comes down to commercials. So it's actually having people with a commercial nous rather than wizards with web tag to start thinking about that. Yep. I think there's a couple of bits here that maybe hopefully support and cover off. So the first thing about the move to service base, um, international accounting standards I believe are being reviewed again. I think 17 just come in and 18 is being formed at the moment. Um, I think the, my personal opinion would move to something 
um, what we call CloudX, but basically service-based revenue uh, process going forward will be incorporated, but they will change the accounting standards to make the treasury be able to change to that position. Yeah. Um, we're currently working on a new uh, commercial uh, route for transport technology infrastructure. Um, we're looking for input from uh, customers and suppliers on what's actually required to deploy so such things as parking meters. Um, <coughs> my wife's a trusted surveyor, she works for a, um, a facilities management company. The, they never pay for um, parking enforcement, it's all done with revenue share or free, free of charge for parking on sites. So it, uh, there are possible commercial mechanisms, it's just how the council actually wants to go out around that and um, the uh, concessions they're willing to put in place. But we are designing at the moment new commercial routes and anyone wants to have a discussion with us, we're more than happy to hear because that will be going to market in the next six to 12 months. Oh, yeah, could we have a conversation? That'd be great, thank you. One more, I think we've got time for one more question before we hand over to my glamorous assistant, to um, <laughs> Graham, <laughs> aka Graham, to do the uh, local data action plan. Hi, it's so Richard Bradley from Transport for the North here. Uh, we represent 20 partners in the North, and I think you need a sort of, it's important to have a critical mass uh, to be able to invest in the data and the exploratory tools you might need. Um, so Devolve Government might be well placed to help our 20 partners in, in reducing the costs of data and models. Uh, so the question to you, Matt, is, you know, how, how do you intend to work with the student transport bodies in the future. That's a very good point. Thank you for that. Um, very keen to work very closely um, with the regional bodies. I recently presented a at to a Subnational Transport Bodies Board, which was chaired by Martin Tugwell, um, and about how we can work more closely together. I think there's an opportunity potentially through the the advisory panel we're, we're setting up. Um, but very keen to get some kind of mechanism, whether it's through Martin's board that he chairs, to to get kind of a regular conversation on these, these kind of things. Because I think massive opportunities from devolution, it's you know political, being a political priority. But actually, how can we make sure that we just don't reinvent the wheel and um, every time, and how can we work more closely together? So definitely up for that conversation. How it's great.